I've lived in the bush all my life and started work in 1970s at Jackaroo on Mother Hungry. So the dock fence has always been a bit of my life. To come and actually work on it, it's probably almost a dream come true, I guess. It's the thin grey line separating wild dogs north of it from sheep to its south. The dog fence spans 5,400 kilometres from the Great Australian Bight through to Queensland's Darling Downs. It's supposed to prevent this, the mauling of small livestock. The metal strain is just incredible. People can't sleep at night, you know, they get up in the morning, they go out, they go around their sheep and they see 30 or 40 sheep predated. They'll continue to to kill livestock continuously and it's a, um, and, in, and in the end you can't actually operate um, at any kind of level of profitability if the dogs get too severe. So James, we're driving along the South Australian dog fence. What does the dog fence mean to you here? Oh, Prue, the dog fence is an a, a essential part of our infrastructure. It protects all the livestock south of the fence in the sheep country. Uh, from predation by wild dogs in particular, um, so it's very important. We couldn't operate without it. James Morgan runs Mootaroo Pastoral Company in South Australia's northeast. The company has four properties, more than five million acres, on both sides of the dog fence. Quinamy Station to the north carries cattle. Wild dog numbers make sheep unviable. To the south, or inside the fence, Mulliungri is for wool growing. The shearing shed hasn't seen much action though. The drought has kept sheep numbers extremely low, and wild dogs have also taken a toll, having seeped through the ageing barrier that's meant to keep them out. Our worst year was two years ago during the beginning of this, this recent drought in 2018. We, uh, we destroyed and trapped uh, over 360 dogs on Mulliangri Station, which is unprecedented. It's a journey through here, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, we're about to go. The sand has drifted so much over the years that beneath these dunes are the remnants of earlier fence lines. In some places there'd be two or three complete fences under the sand hills. So two or three fence lines actually beneath the current fence line. It's that's kind of gobsmacking. Like it's hard to even imagine that, isn't it? Well, well it is really, yeah. It's, it's, Dog exclusion fences were first built around private properties more than a century ago. In the 1940s, their perimeters were joined to form part of the continuous fence we see today. It's consistently patrolled by employees of the various state governments, checked for holes and insecure posts, and trappers catch and kill problematic dogs. But the simple fact is, many of these posts and wires are a hundred years old. This section of the South Australian dog fence is a really good example of how it's been fixed and refixed over the years. This is the original rabbit wire, and it's probably 80 years old, and that's the top of that fence, this barbed wire. So you can see how much is buried beneath this sand dune. This wire here is probably from the 1970s. It's called marsupial wire, and it allowed the small marsupials to come in, but not the larger ones. And then that was extended again later on. And this wire here is much more recent and it's been very securely anchored into the ground so that no animals can get underneath. You can see why they want a new one. In May, work began on the new 1600 kilometre South Australian dog fence. With $25 million from the state and federal governments and the sheep industry, there are staged tenders for different sections. Barra-based fencing contractor David Miller has invested around $400,000 in new equipment, 
and has been completing the first 11 kilometres. Well, we use this tractor which runs on auto steer to give us an AB line. We work about three metres off the fence, start at three metres and hopefully end at three metres. We go back to the start, so that could be two k's back, and then start driving our droppers and posts in, and we put a kilometre in about every two and a half hours. Only once a section of the new fence is built can the old one be demolished. It's a brutal affair. Decades of history bound up in barbed wire are bulldozed. You get mixed feelings about these things. You don't like to see things just bulldozed down the road that have, that have got history about them. But yeah, we've, got to, we've still got to think about progress and, and uh, the enhancement of, that, of our great industry. Wool grower Greg Trelaw has lost 2,800 sheep, two wild dogs, over the past three years. And he's destroyed more than 200 dogs. And that's inside the fence, where sheep are meant to be protected. The drought to the north has forced all the dogs to move down and put pressure on the fence. The roos and everything else moving down as well would put pressure. Holes would form, the dogs would come through, go over the top in some spots. The fifth generation pastoralist won the contract for the early earthworks. The next section will be on his property. He'd really like to get that job. Oh, it would be awesome to do that. I mean, it's been really nice to be able to say we've been part of the start of the fence rebuild, but to actually do something on your own place would be really nice. Once the fence is down, the tinder dry native pine posts and generations of mangled metal is burnt. History going up in smoke. It's the price of progress. By 2025, the new fence should be finished and the systematic culling of dogs inside it will really kick off. A policy before the South Australian government could make baiting with 1080 poison compulsory, something most local pastoralists support. We think that everyone or every property should have some uh, baits placed out twice a year just to keep a lid on any kind of populations of dogs that people are unaware of. Baiting is controversial though, and ecologist Dr Catherine Mosby says it shouldn't be mandatory. I think if you don't have a dingo issue to force people to go and put baits out when they might have working dogs, you know, it takes time, it takes money, and if there's no problem, if there's no issue with dingoes there, then, you know, it sort of seems a bit unnecessary. In these parts, the fence is all about protecting livestock from vicious wild dogs. We know that, but behind the scenes, there is a greater debate going on about what actually constitutes a wild dog. New DNA research shows that most outback dogs, in fact, almost all of them, are either dingo or part dingo, and there are growing calls to protect them as a native Australian animal. All state, federal and territory governments define wild dogs as dingoes, domestic dogs that have gone feral, and hybrids. But University of New South Wales ecologist Dr Kylie Cairns says it's time to stop calling dingoes wild dogs. There is a perception in the public that in Australia there are large populations of feral dogs roaming around Australia and DNA testing essentially says that no that's not correct these animals are dingoes and dingoes are a native animal. Feral domestic dogs are more prevalent in the high country of Victoria and New South Wales but in outback Western, Central and South Australia they're largely dingoes. In South Australia, it's revealed that 100% of the animals are more than three quarters dingo and 90% are pure or probable dingoes. She believes pastoralists should learn to live with dogs, particularly as studies now show there are unique strains of dingoes in different regions. 
what braziers should be focusing on is non-lethal control. So that's finding ways to protect your stock from predation, but not eradicating the dingoes in the area. So you might use things like electric fencing or livestock guardian animals or targeted lethal control of animals that are particularly eating your sheep or cattle instead of landscape level aerial baiting where you're essentially eradicating an entire population across a large landscape. Dr Catherine Mosby is another University of New South Wales ecologist, but she lives on South Australia's Air Peninsula. Her view is that dingoes and small livestock probably can't coexist. So if there is to be a sheep industry, then the dogs do need to be controlled south of the fence. I see both sides. I mean, I, I know a lot of pastoralists and I can see the damage that dingoes do. And I guess I, I just want to find that middle ground where we are protecting the dingo as a legitimate wildlife species, but we're also recognising that it can do damage and at some times we, you know, we have to control them as well. But Dr Mosby is concerned dingoes are increasingly being targeted north of the fence. It's short-sighted because research shows they keep rabbit, goat and kangaroo populations in check. Baiting dingoes in cattle production areas can actually be detrimental to um, cattle producers. So dingoes perform an ecosystem function of controlling kangaroo populations. And so if we have dingoes in an area, they perform a net benefit to cattle farmers by improving the amount of pasture available to cattle farmers. <laughs> Chair of the SA Dog Fence Board, Jeff Power, maintains there are plenty of dingoes north of the fence, so they're not in any way a threatened species. And the law is pretty clear. The legislation says that dogs inside the fence must be eradicated, they're deemed a pest, and outside the fence the dogs are deemed a native animal and they have got some sort of protection. Uh, but when numbers become extremely high, uh, landholders can uh, take control methods. To you as someone who runs sheep and cattle, does it make a difference as to whether it's a dingo or some other kind of hybrid? Um, if I'm being honest, no, because it's in my eyes it's a, a predator. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a dog lover the same as anyone else, are pet dogs, but, but dogs that are out here, uh, they're not where they should be. You could argue that outside the dog fence there is a uh, some relevance to whether they are a purebred dingo or not, but inside that they are fair game for us, I think. That debate will continue, but the fence construction now stops for a few weeks as new wire and posts are sourced. Demand following the bushfires and trade delays because of the pandemic have slowed supply. Dave Miller wants to continue his work on the dog fence though. He's well aware of the iconic nature of this job. I've lived in the bush all my life and started work in 1970s at Jackaroo on Mully Angry. So the dog fence has always been a bit of my life. The first time I ever saw a dog fence, I thought it was a big deal when I was 17 years old. I thought this is fantastic. So to come and actually work on it, it's probably almost a dream come true, I guess. <laughs>